um, yeah, home again to ordinary pain, which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. To explode beneath the feet, um, if, well, it, indirectly, it, it's, it's the narrator saying here that the wolfographer is risk his own, risking his own life by being out there. Maybe he's welcoming death. Maybe it's some sort of weird cathartic thing for him because his life at home is so bad, as we've just seen in the previous line. Um, heat. So metaphorically, um, he's getting too close to this heat. He, it is actually affecting him, even though he thought it might be some sort of weird paradoxical escape going off in, in a war-torn country. He is being scarred by it mentally. His hands are trembling. Something is happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes, a half-formed ghost. He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval. Okay, so something is happening within himself, really. This is a vague illusion. Even though he's, he's focusing on external things, it's actually within his, his mind and within his own heart and feelings. Twist, um, so it suggests agony, of course. But it may also suggest the vault of the shift, the turning point in the poem as he's finally confronting his um, deepest fears and darkest memories. Half-formed ghost. So the person in the photograph is dead. That's, that's heavily implied here. But it seems to be this person seems to be haunting him, accusing him, maybe almost you know, like Banquo's ghost, um, of not helping. And then um, not uh, the suggestion here that the the, the, um, the man who's died. Yeah, it is a man. Uh, that the man who's died is not fully remembered. He's tried to blot it out of his memory, which is why it's only a ghost, only half-remembered features, uh, but he's finally confronting um, the man in the photograph at last. Remembers, obviously, this links back to the fact that he's deep digging into his mind to reveal those memories and bring them up again. Um, and Jean went out to cries, this emphasizes, cries, it emphasizes this um, sense of despair. And then this man's wife, there's a focus now on the living, like in Poppies, you know, it focuses on the other people who are affected by war, even if they're not, if they're not soldiers. He sought approval. Um, this is for the photo to be taken, but there's no mention of approval being given, uh, and yet the photo is being taken anyway. So there's that moral ambiguity, there's that voyeurism, which could come into play here, should the photo have been taken in the first place. Yeah, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must and how the blood stained into foreign dust. So without words, so he's not, he doesn't have the courage really to ask. And how does one ask? Um, can I take a photo of your dead husband? It's how sincere, you know, is this idea of consent, I suppose, if there are no words spoken, if there's no sign that it's right or accepted. What someone must. So he feels that it's his duty, or maybe he's excusing himself here. Maybe he's letting himself off by, you know, making it seem more noble than it actually is. Half stained into foreign dust. Um, so it's, it's a sort of cliche here. It's common war semantics and war language. Because war itself is a cliche. It's inescapable. It's always around. It's as old as, you know, time itself, or at least, you know, as old as humanity. And, um, a hundred agonies in black and white, from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. A hundred agonies, yeah, the, the, it's the agonies of those in the pictures, preserved. Um, black and white, um, so obviously it refers to the colour, of the, or the lack of colour of the, the monochrome pictures, but, you know, symbolically, this is a, an allusion to right and wrong as well, which hints at the internal conflict of the war photographer. The editor will pick out five or six. So it's really dismissive. It's really obscene again. It's it's not taking into account the human suffering, the the, the real lives, which or, or you know the, the real deaths in this case, which are shown in the photographs. How can one be so dismissive about? Okay, right. This one looks the best. This one's most effective. It's talking about human life here and human suffering and all of the lives connected with this suffering. 
Sunday supplement. So it's not even on the front page. The photos will not be seen. It won't be the first thing that people will notice. It's not, ironically, it's not that important. It'll just be buried within a newspaper. And so the photos, how much impact are they going to have? Are they going to change public perception? Probably not. Prick. So the reader's eyeballs prick with tears. Um, so it's, it's violent. A verb here, um, but it also means you know something which is tiny and not fully formed. And so again, this hints at the fact that um, these pictures of violence—they're not going to have the desired result. Tears and beers. There's an internal rhyme here. Um, it, it feels weirdly jolly, which is ironic, of course, and it quickens the pace. So the reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and the pre-lunch beers. It trips off the tongue here. But it also ties um, the two words together, um, the idea of um, pathos, washing away, um, uh, the idea that these people, you know, they're immune to suffering overseas. They're too used to tragic stories and pictures. They're oversaturated by it. Um, people depend on the suffering of others for entertainment. You know, think of drama. Um, you know, television drama and things. It's all about suffering because it's interesting. Think about the stories, the sensational stories you read in the newspapers. Again, it's about suffering. It's about things that go wrong. But, you know, people ignore the deeper humanity, really. They read it for entertainment um, or they ignore it. Beers as well as self-medication. So you think of the two um, words that are tied together in the rhyme. Tears and beers may be um, in order to avoid um, feeling more deeply about this people just turn to mindless entertainment drinking away drinking as though you know to um uh, forget basically about all the horrible things in the world to alleviate their own sense of conscience maybe that they're not doing anything to help um, again so much of our lives are lived in ignorance as they're saying ignorance is bliss um and what you don't know won't hurt you and all that and then the last couple of lines uh, from the aeroplane, he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. So in the aeroplane, he stares. So it's a bit ambiguous here. He's either staring at Britain or um, at the war. So this is obviously referring to how he's going back out to where the, to where the fighting is. Impassively. Um, so this suggests that he's been destroyed by his role. He takes no pleasure in anything. He cannot feel emotion with those at home. It's common theme for those who've experienced war um, because they don't care. Those those back at home, they just want to carry on with their lives. They're not directly impacted by the war, so they're going to pretend it doesn't happen. So the photographer's work is a tragedy. Um, not only is it morally ambiguous, but it's ineffectual. It's affected him. We see this, he's trembling, but nobody else. They take a fleeting look, these readers, and they carry on about their day. So there's a futility, a real futility of expressing the reality of conflict. Um, earns his living, yes, yeah, so he's earning his living from other suffering. We've already talked about this and the moral ambigu ambiguity which surrounds it. Um, so essentially the question is, what, what are, are we to do with the pictures? What ought we to do? Um, and maybe there's no easy answer to that. And because there's no easy answer, people don't want to think too deeply about it. So they look at it and then they move on. Um, and obviously it's ironic that he's using this word living because the people that he's taking photographs of are dying. They don't have that luxury. They do not care. So this is an attack on um, the public, uh, the wider world, the reader, you know, us perhaps. Uh, this is ultimately the message of the poem. So, um, Let's talk about what are we going to do about it when we see the pictures of war? How how are we to respond? What is the right way to respond? And again, there's no easy answer, which is you know why it's an effective poem. It forces us to think. And um, yeah, you've got you've got a sort of uh, rhyming couplet there as well. I haven't got a note on it, um, but yeah, maybe there's that sense of hope that you know we will be able to find a solution. We will be able to, um, I don't know, come together and prevent further war. It's up to you. Um, but hopefully that has been helpful. So thank you very much, as ever, for watching.